I'm Pastor Duncan. It's May 2nd, 2021. Welcome to Change the World Church. Let's pray. Thank you, Father God, for this incredible day and month. And as we just continue to see life coming alive and just the colors and birds we hear and just the, the bushes and the, the flowers and trees, just everything, just life. And that life comes from your hand. And as a creator, you can sunset the stars, but just seeing the spring come to life, the time you came back from the grave, you came to life and rose from the dead. It's just incredible. We celebrate you, Lord, and everything. You have the sweet smells and shapes and just the way your hand fashioned it's impossible, Lord. It's incredible. Jesus, let me pray. Amen. Amen. So let's open the Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. It is incredible, the hand of God. You know, before, when you're just after your own selfish nature and serving your own mini God within yourself and going after your own fleshly desires, uh, the sins that Christ was tempted to in the desert, you remember? Um, flesh. Flesh. He was tempted for flesh just to fill him his belly or any fleshly desire that has to do with your sensations or anything in your body. Power. Power. Tempted for power to take force of deity and to seize God-like power of his of a manly through a manly like robbing it, like seizing it like robbery rather than morphed and changed and being God in himself which he was God, he was God's son. He was already God. But to seize it in a, in, a, in a manly, fleshly, like plundering way, to try to grab it from that selfish desire, that's a temptation, that kind of power. To be God-like as a man and do it your own way with, with your fleshly hands. He was also tempted with like earthly power, like to be a, a king. Yeah, to be a king and all that comes along with that, like wealth and um, command and prestige and money and all, all that goes along with that. Yeah, not only did he was he tested to call on God's power on his own desire, but also to have all the riches and lands and those kind of things. So, yeah, similar, similar vein, whatever it is that you're, for your sake, to fill that fill up for your own power or glory or flesh or desire. Those are the temptations. So as we think about uh, today, I want you to, to, to focus on, on Christ and just he is, he is the Lord. And God has the ultimate plan and power and glory and Christ's ultimate sacrifice for us. Today's title of the sermon, Christ is our model and Lord God. Well, the title is Philippians dash Christ is our model and Lord God dash our citizenship is in heaven. So where's your citizenship? In heaven. Yes, if you're a believer. So the point is to do that, you have to Die to self, fill with Christ. All right, thank you. Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, bond service of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from our God, from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God and all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel and capitalize the gospel because that is the word of God and the word of God is Christ in the gas in the gospel from every day until now for I'm confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus for it is only right for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel, 
You all are partakers of grace with me. So after you got rid of those fleshly desires and you sacrificed them, and you laid all that out and were filled with Christ, he then opened my eyes and my ability to actually see the beauty we were talking about. So after that, then I could see God's hand. Then I could see the beauty. Before, I don't, I mean, maybe I regarded flowers in passing, but I was kind of thinking about math and physics and, you know, sports and, you know, all the dude stuff, guy stuff that you do. Um, I mean, I know that God created women beautiful, that's obvious. But like seeing really things like a flower or a bush or how um, things are woven by the hand of God, that takes the supernatural power of God for a man to be able to see that um, in, in just incredible beauty. And for the woman, for that not to die in her, but to, but to continue to blossom in her and joy takes the hand of God. And then all that just blossoms and all the things that he desired for you to see as beautiful and were made to see as beautiful and enjoy, you gather the flowers and you make the, you know, trees and you, you trim up the shape, the things, that, even the patterns on the dishes are woven and beautiful and floral. But you appreciate all that stuff as a hand of God and then it becomes beautiful and it fills you and awesome because it's Christ filling because you can see it in him. And that's what we're seeing right now in the spring and the life. We can see life in Christ. And then that's why he's having that joy. I mean, these guys, he's having that deep joy. Of the gospel, you are partakers of grace with me. Verse 8. For God is my witness. How long for you, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. So how do you, how are you able to long for people with the affection of Christ Jesus? Only if you're... You have Christ. Only if you have Christ. <clears throat> and this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge in all discernment. The so there's another Romans 12, 1 and 2 and 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse. Psalm 37, 4, 1 John 5. To be able to have real knowledge in all discernment. There's another one. You can only have real knowledge and discernment. And the opposite would be Romans 1. As you go away from Christ and sin, you lose knowledge and discernment and get you're given over to a depraved mind and um, you lose the ability to see true knowledge and true discernment which was the epitome for what man was after and the Greeks were interestingly enough noted for trying to bring all philosophies in from everywhere trying to figure out what was the highest knowledge and seeking that not that it hadn't been sought forever even in Daniel, they sought those who had the highest knowledge, right? In Daniel's time, the Babylonians. And they brought in the satraps, right? And they brought in the wise men. And they were always seeking what is the highest wisdom. And where was it? It was always in Christ. And all was given from God. And when you seek Christ and God and humble yourself, then you can see the true discernment and knowledge and have that depth and wisdom and knowledge. As he's shown us, as we as we just see in Christ and in the in his holy scriptures through, through Christ alone and, and the Lord. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. How, how awesome is that? Real knowledge and all discernment. So you may approve the things that are excellent. So what is excellent and how do you know what's approved? through discernment in Christ and the Spirit. There it is again, capitalized the same verses, the same other scriptures we're talking about. Romans 12, 1 and 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 John 5, the Colossians verse last week. Romans 1, the opposite of that. So you may approve the things that are excellent in order, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. Having been filled, so satisfaction, what do you want? Deep desire, you want to be filled? Having been filled with what? The fruit of righteousness. And everyone knows, every culture knows, no matter who, who you are, that virtue and true justice and true righteousness is something you have to have in order to lead, in order to be respected, 
in order to survive, in order for society to work, that virtue of true righteousness and the, the fruit of that, feeling good, clean consciousness, all these things are always uh, held in society. But the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ, as we know definitively, to the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Capitalize it, the gospel. So that my imprisonment for the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard. And to everyone else, that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. But some also from goodwill, right? The right conscience, the right place, the right reasons. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. Let's capitalize the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether pretense or in truth, capitalized truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Christ Jesus, according to my earnest expectation and hope. Hope in what? Christ. Christ. <clears throat> that I will not be put to shame in anything. So his prayer was, he's done all this, has all this testimony, all this writing. He's lived for Christ, miraculous things happening through Christ everywhere, just miracles. And he's written letters and he's written testimony of Christ and he's lived for Christ and he's been faithful and he heard the Holy Spirit and he guided and he obeyed when the Holy Spirit directed him. And he's done all this and um, his prayer is just not to, to die in a, such a shameful way, not for his sake, but in such a way that would any way, shape or form discredit Christ. And he knows that would be the case because Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So he knows that whatever is done is not going to eliminate all the witness of Christ that he's performed. In other words, the devil would like to kill Jesus and be done with it, but he came back from the dead and just thundered that he conquered death and the most brutal betrayal and the most brutal death possible and the, and the most sh you know shameful thing possible you could possibly do. So. Paul knows that he is not going to be eliminated in such a way in all the scripture, which is the Holy Word of God, that was going to become scripture. It was scripture because of the Holy Spirit at that time, even before time began, would not be eliminated. In other words, he wouldn't be discounted in such a way that all that gospel work would be eliminated. He knew that. So whether he dies or whether he lives, as long as it's for Christ and in Christ and not done in such a way that has any blemish or mark whatsoever on the Lord. But the Lord does things. Remember, he says, for my glory, even back all the way, going back to the Old Testament. Hey, look, I'm doing this miraculously and I'm doing this for my glory and my reputation, despite man. So we, he knows, he has the confidence to know that Christ, Christ and the gospel perpetuate and continue for God's glory. And he has that. And that's the point. And that's the win. The ultimate is God is ultimate just and honorable and all peace and joy and love and all power and all glory reside in him. And the point is to eliminate flesh and just fill with Christ and his glory, which will be done, is done. I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. All right, let's just pray again. Father God, you are life and you are the only life and you're the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You're, you hold the seven stars in your hand. You're at the right hand of God. The Holy Spirit and you are one. 
it's the breath of God, the blast of the Lord that goes in as people repent of their sins and receive you. You're all knowledge and truth and discernment. Uh, everything was created in you and with you. And it's, it's all life is through you and fulfilled in you. Lord, we just pray that uh, we continue every day to just eliminate self, repent of sins, pursue you, and live for you. Just in prayer. So looking back at the beginning, so where, who was the book of Philippians written to? Uh, the Church, Church of Philippi. Of Philippi. <laughs> Great. Nice. So where was Philippi, or what about Philippi? Philippopolis? Yeah, so Philippi, so here is, remember we've been talking about the seven churches? So over here is modern day Turkey. So the Mediterranean, Israel's down here. So as we came up here, remember Paul's first journey? through here, second journey, he comes up, he wasn't permitted to go into uh, Asia. Asia. And the seven churches that we talked about in Revelation were kind of set on what's called Asia. Um, and then they weren't permitted to go into Bithynia, good, great. And then, uh, so he went over to Mysia, and then he prayed at Troas, and he got a vision to go where? Macedonia. Right. He got a vision for Macedonia. So this is Macedonia. And then from there, he traveled where? Uh, south. To Galatia, right? Yay. <laughs> Galatia's <laughs> over here. <laughs> Who did Paul write to in Galatia? What book? 100% today, Galatians. Just as a side tribute. So from there, he went up to Illyria, right? No. No, he never went to Illyria, right? He did. We just learned that. Remember, that was a trivia question. Two oh. weeks ago, I'm like, what's the furthest Paul ever traveled? And then where is Illyria? Remember that trivia question? It actually mentions that in Romans. He actually went to Illyria. But all the lines are here, right? So at some point he, but the Illyrians and Macedonians, you know. So anyway, this is this is kind of a point of contention. Back, Celts were up in here, Celts were up in here, Celts were up in here. So okay, Macedonians, and then he went into where, <laughs> right? Greece, but you know, then it was called, you know. Achaia, okay, yeah, you know, um, this is this is called the province of Athens, uh, Thessaly. You know, they were they were provinces. They were fiercely independent states. And what state was all the way down here? Sparta. Sparta. Um, okay, so when uh, where's Philippi? Right. Right. Yeah. So remember, he went from Troas, Samothrace, and then landed in Neapoli, and then went to Philippi. So what was significant about Philippi? What was interesting about it? In biblical times, and also um, back in the time of, where did Philippi get its name? Was it named after King Alexander the, uh, the Great's dad? Yeah. So Alexander the Great's dad was King Philip, Philip. of Macedon. So um, that goes back into to the three fifties, you know, three even before that three seventies. So um, they had a dynasty, and then the dynasty um, they were killed and, and fighting, protecting their borders, and they were fighting, you know, constantly fighting Thrace, Poinonia, Illyria, trying to maintain their borders. This is kind of mountainous in this area. Um, what city was here, by the way? Was it, which of these three? Was it 
Constantinople? Was it Istanbul or was it Byzantium? Byzantium. They're all the same. But oh. back then it was called Byzantium. Byzantium. Sorry, Byzantium. So Byzantium was a city that is went on to be Constantinople and then modern day Istanbul. So interesting, right there. Because um, that was one of the ways you kind of came across, you know, into more. I guess proper what would become Europe, you know, eventually. Okay, so um, the kings had died, and then the son of one of the kings, who's super young, was sent to take over Macedonia, but their army had been wiped out fighting the Illyrians and others. So they're literally the Macedonian army was wiped out. It was early on. The whole Archimedean Empire was right up to here. And who was in charge of that or who had started that empire? What were they called again? The Achaemenid in Empire. I'm not saying that exactly perfectly. So the Medes Persians. So why is this significant that we're laying in all this background? Because of Daniel's vision, it's all in the Bible. I should let you answer that. So all this has been, it's, it's super interesting to us because the Lord literally laid it all down. Jesus himself laid it all down to Daniel and literally walked through all of the history of what would happen up to Christ. I mean, incredible. Cyrus set up the kingdom. That's what I was looking for, King Cyrus. Went on into. I'm not gonna tell you already right, so who the next king was. You guys know this. I'm gonna let you. That's a, it'll be just a, like a thing you can you can be looking up or thinking about. Darius. Mm -hmm, good. Great. King Darius. Perfect. Okay, so before all that, um, not going all the way, you know. Garden, 1700 years flood, Abraham 300 years later, King David 1000 years later. All right, from that to Christ in the interim, Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom. Who took out the Northern Kingdom? The Syrians. Good. And they were stationed in capital. Oh, oh Nineveh. Nineveh. Nineveh, which was on what two rivers? One of the two. Tyrus or Euphrates? Yeah, exactly. Um, and then uh, who, uh, so the Assyrians took out the northern kingdom of Jerusalem, so left. Who took out the southern kingdom of Jerusalem? Oh, and then they went into exile for 70 oh, years. Yes. And so who was their names and characters that were part of the exile? Oh, Daniel. Yeah, Daniel. Oh, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. From maybe interesting. Queen Esther. That's what I'm looking at you. Oh. <laughs> Queen Esther, right? Yeah. So then, um, how did they get back, or how, who? When they who helped start build the walls? Anybody know in the Bible? That was in the Bible, Nehemiah, and he had had to get paperwork, right? Mm -hmm. From Babylon, right? Mm -hmm. From the kings we just talked about. So. Then um, that, so who who took over? Sorry, who to, sorry who took over for the who took over the Babylonians? Medes Persians. Yeah, conquered them, right? And that was all listed in the not only the statue visions but also the later visions of the animals. And I mean, he's told it multiple ways. I mean, just walked through the whole thing. So Medes Persians are now um, 
uh, up to who? And they are the ones that gave the permissions to come back and rebuild the walls. So the Medes Persians, that takes us up to here. So who's next? The Greeks. So we're not there yet. So that's why this is so interesting. The Medes Persians have conquered. We know the Greeks are going to because Jesus himself said, and we know who's going to conquer the Greeks. Yeah, all this has been laid out, but we're not there yet. So that's why it's so incredible. This is right. This is now in you know the 350s, 360s, 370s, 380s time frame. And um, so uh, one of the King Dynasty's young, young, young son was set to take over. But Philip um, was one of the brothers, but the son of the king. So he was made steward and kind of mentor um, over him. But within a year, he he took over. He had a, I mean, he had a regal, you know, family title to it. But you don't ever hear much about King Philip, right? It's all about who? Alexander, Alexander the Great. Because he, he was the one who conquered. He was the one who conquered. So um, King Philip, though, when he took over, he had border problems everywhere. Illyria, Thrace, Athens, the city-state of Athens was actually kind of coming up and establishing themselves on different borders. Um, and so uh, what he had done is he had been captured when he was younger. And he had been captured and taken down um, and um, in the, in the um, Thessalonians they had a sacred guard of the, the uh, Thessalonians and they were just super warriors like super strong fighters um, and then this whole area here um, where Chernea is or this whole region down here um, was um, they bonded together along with that guy, guard and uh, was, a, was a prominent force to be contended with. And so he was in this area, he'd actually study their tactics. And so their tactics actually included um, Greek soldiers, I mean elite Greek soldiers, and they had about 50 pounds of armor. They had uh, shields um, that were, uh, um, you know, lightweight but slightly bigger and then they had formed these um, units of 10 by 10 soldiers and that um, they had these spears uh, that were about 10 feet long and so they formed these regiments and with those uh, kind of that kind of phalanx um, which was actually the one that um, that we're going to talk about had been perfected but he studied this sacred guard and he was imprisoned by him and then he was mentored by them and he got a kind of a military education under them as he was younger well eventually he got to go back to macedon and um he first thing he had to do was his whole army had been was basically in shambles and had been destroyed so he actually organized guards and army and started training them up because he had the training experience and he invented uh, the 16 man phalanx. And it was 16 by 16, ended up being, check my mind, 254, I think, men. Um, so 254 men, but 16 wide and 16 deep. And then he worked to get their armor down to 40 pounds, 256. Is that what we said? 254. 256, yeah. I was like six times six is 36. Yeah, perfect. So 256. Yeah, that no, didn't sound right. 256 men. And they had uh, got their shields down to 24 inches. So 24 inch shields, and they would wear them around their neck because he took the lances and got them up to 18 feet. So he had super strong 18 foot lances. And um, 16 by 16. Uh, and eventually, um, this would go on even in his day, or maybe it was Alexander the Great's day, they started modifying it and would put archers in the middle. And um, I was just kind of praying about it, but eventually they had to figure out how to get their shields. Maybe the attachment of the shields 
Anyway, maybe they had guys who held shields for them, you know, in defense. Because what, you know, you would basically come in as an artillery unit and then you would have the 18 uh, foot lances. And, but Alan Phillips' tactics were, that was his advancing guard to basically kind of hold the army at bay. And so he advanced these guys. Nobody could really come in because they had shorter lances and smaller phalanxes. So he had the bigger phalanxes with the longer lances and the protection, you know, with archery support and also mainly those. And then what he would do was make way for the cavalry and then the armored cavalry would make their way through and then just route them uh, as they would come in and kind of hold them, make them, put them at still and get them in, pin them in the position they wanted to and then they would get routed by the cavalry. Once she broke uh, the, the flanks, you know, outflanked them, then it was, it was one because you'd get the better ground and just route them from there. So uh, his first famous victory was getting the, um, some of the city states who kind of come on their borders out. So that built up his acclaim enough to be able to build up the armies. And then eventually it came down to, he was besieging uh, Byzantium and basically besieging the city because his goal was to start conquering and beating back the Persians. You know, because once you get kind of spread out, it's really up to the will of the people, right? And the will of the people and their influence. And there are already some people coming in here, the Ionians, remember? We talked about that in the seven churches and um, Greek. So then once he uh, had established that, then he was besieging this, the city-states under a senator bucked and said, because they're fiercely independent and free, right? It only works if... That's the thing, is in order to conquer, you have to ha have freedom. Men want to be free, and you want to, and the, the ultimate liberation of freedom is what? In Christ. In Christ. So Christ made us to want to be free or liberated, but we can only be free from sin and truly free in Christ. That's the only thing. And you want eternal life, but you want it perfect, but the only way you can have that is in Christ. Eliminating self and being remolded into a, a vessel for him is perfect to be used in Christ. So it all boiled down to this. It all came down to a, a couple of battles and then the big battle of Cheronea. And this region, like different philosophers and stuff came from and um, the ones that uh, uh, wrote a play that my son's having to study right now, uh, that was written in this uh, region. And so there's all these false philosophies and all these strange things were coming about from there. So it all boiled down to that. They amassed their army of equal numbers basically King Philip, and they had superior ground and they were on their own turf and they had a better position, a strong. And then King Philip routed them. So his tactics worked and he knew, interesting, he knew their tactics. So he outflanked them, eliminated them, and then crushed them. And the other, I think 300 or so, whatever it was, chased them into the ocean and uh, they ended up drowning them. So. One of the most important things is what were they fighting for? Were they were the Greeks and Macedonians fighting each other for Christ? They were called, it was called the Third Sacred War. What were they fighting for? What were the Greeks fighting for? What is it? What were, the, what were the Greeks fighting for? Would be like just pride. Glory. They wanted glory. And what it is is so when you got buried and you died, you got a glorious burial where both men and the Dindy gods they made up, right? The Dindy gods on um, Mount Olympus would look down and go. That's a warrior, man. That guy fought bravely and valiantly. And then the other men would be like, that was a brave warrior. We should sing and talk about him and make, write ballads about him for the rest of time and immortalize that guy for his bravery. That's what they fought for. And so the ultimate thing would be to have an awesome burial, either a uh, burial of gold and tombs and they put the coins in the eye you know why 
to pay their way across the river. Sticks, yeah. They had to pay their way to the underworld guy to get into, and then they would glory and continue the same glorious, like, you know, tell it, wow, that was a great, what you did out there, and man, you know, that was what their thought process, they, they just kind of made that stuff up. So what was the worst thing that they could think of? Two worst things, maybe. A drowning. Oh, and maybe a fiery pyre or like a glory. Something that honored some kind of death. All cultures, all cultures have that honorable burial where everyone's like, wow, what a soldier, you know. And they're singing about him and, you know, and the, the wives were like, that's my husband. And you make up the guy, you know, the gods made up or like, you know, that's what they thought. That's what they were fighting for. Yes, to protect homeland and interest, but at the end of the day, they're really fighting for glory. Like there wasn't any, they couldn't think of any other purpose beyond that. So if you drowned, you just basically got sunk into the underworld, straight to the underworld, basically, so to speak, without any glorious recognition, nothing, just into oblivion. No glorious funeral, no stories, just drowned in defeat. I mean, so that was, that was like one of the worst things they could possibly think of. So to drown those guys in the ocean. And then the other thing that would, that was as bad or if not worse, maybe worse would be crucifixion. That's the worst thing you could happen because it's embarrassing. It's shameful. There's no glory. You're basically strung out every bit of honor and glory and recognition uh, in life if among your peers and your and your demi demon gods you've made up would be eliminated, strung up on a cross, treated as the as the worst common criminal, stripped of all dignity and all respect. The worst thing that could happen. From a from a fleshly brain or even I mean, just pain and shame and undignified and every stretch of the imagination. So King Philip conquered Macedon and was, after that victory, um, they had the uh, peace treaty, essentially Council of Corinth. And that peace treaty united all the Greek states. There's only one that wouldn't bow the knee. That was Sparta. So he sent a blistering message saying, if you don't bow down and submit to me. Then if you don't, then we'll come in and pillage your, you know, towns, burn your villages, women, you know, take all your treasure, just do everything from them, you know, if you don't do that. And they sent back a one word reply both times. One word, in quotes, if. Uh, Meaning, <laughs> come on. <laughs> you think you got what it takes? So he never went down there. They left it, he and everyone, and, his, and Alexander the Great both left him alone. So they both decided, eh, you know, we got <laughs> things to do, like the rest of the world. So it's kind of interesting. And it's well protected. And they, I mean, all they do is like fight. I mean, like you're born and the mom's like putting a small like wooden dagger in the kid's hand. He's like, come on, get that toy. You got it. Hey, get that ball. A little more to the left. Take hey, better balance on your combat crawl. Okay, mom, you know. So, I mean, every, you know, they were training warriors. That's what they did, you know. Wow, that one looks fit. Yes, he does. Can he pull a bow? Oh, you know, I mean, that, that was the whole culture. So to go down there and attack them and they're, you know, that'd be, I mean, they'd fight every last man, woman, you know, it'd just be, if you wouldn't like win a battle and then they, the rest of the city state go, ah, you know what? That was our elite guard. Let's make a treaty. That's not the way the sport was operated. Well, these guys, after they won, they, the rest of them said, you know what? Let's make a treaty. That's, you know, that was our elite guard. <laughs> um, and so they would make a treaty, not half, maybe not happily, but they made a treaty, but they all united and recognized um, King Philip as, as the general, as the leader. And guess what that word was? The strategio. So the head general. 
So he became the leader and now he finally united all of Greece, which was difficult because they were all independent cities that, I mean, each one had a fierce culture, fierce pride in their city. You know, they're all going for glory, right? Every one of them wants glory and the gods and, you know, the, the, all that junk. And you, you get a bunch of demi demons all wanting to be number one. So to unite that band of, you know, group is difficult, but he, he united them and would turn his attention now back on his attempt to get through the Persian Empire and was assassinated by his own, one of his own guard, inner guard, elite guard members. So, or somebody close to him. So he was assassinated. He'd lost an eye in the interim. His leg had been injured through the battles. So, um, guess who took over? Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, but who knew that all that was teed up for Alexander the Great and he inherited all that. They were both from a little town up in this area and um, up in here, sorry. And so they were really born in Macedonia in that center. And so Alexander's, and because they developed the lighter weight armor, they got it from 50 pounds down to 40 pounds. And so they had lighter weight, good tactics. They were fast. And so remember, just like Jesus said, it's like, a, what was it? A, Goat or a ram or something? Yeah, one of them was a leopard, like super fast, and then one of them had like a goat or ram with wings. A goat. With, with, they could fly, right? Or something. Both of them kind of connotated speed. And so they were just speed. Um, also, Philippi was a key city because it was right in the mountains. Guess what they mined there? Copper or tin. You know, interesting you said that. Um, the, sh the way he got his. Um, shields down, I meant to mention, they were wooden shields coated in bronze. So he got that, it was, it was lightweight and strong, uh, 24 inches, and could be worn. And um, I think they, were, they developed a way to like take the shield mm -hmm. while they were fighting with their lances and used it, you know, not only they could protect them in the front, or I bet the guys in the back could do something too, you know. Or maybe they had them, but uh, it was actually a center or mine for gold. So literally, once you had Philippi, you could start mining gold. And he literally Philip paid for his campaign, and a lot of it, like he would marry, he married a wife from Ilia, Illyria, and set up a treaty with them. And so the wife was like made it peaceful and then he raided him crushed him later despite his marriage with her but he used that kind of stuff they call it intrigue meaning double cross and shady tactics and he would go in and like be about to take over and then he would send in a ton of money and buy a, enough allegiance to cause a rebellion and then the inner rebellions would cl collapse things before he would come over in so he, he could when you have money and you can make gold and you can just continue to mint that uh, led to his campaign. So Philippi was an important city. Later, the Battle of Philippi in the Roman Empire was between Brutus and Cassius versus um, Antony and Octavius. Antony and Octavius. Very good. <laughs> Battle of, and that was like what? Anyway, let me get the exact date for you. It's like the forties. BC. Ah, 42 BC. So 42 BC, Battle of Philippi, which was super uh, critical in terms of establishing um, the Roman Empire. And so when, um, who won? Uh, Antony Octavius. When they won and beat Brutus and Cassius, it went from being uh, city-states to a republic. Sounds a lot like 
Star Wars at this point, didn't it? <laughs> a Republic. That's probably where they got that from. And then became like everyone was incorporated at that point. Instead of being more freedom and da da da, it was like a Republic where everybody was under that. And then you had whole sections of the Republic. And Caesar, you know, um, uh, was like in charge of all that. So that's that's what happened at that battle, so significant. And speaking of that, um, tell me about the Praetorian Guard. That's what you mentioned, right? That he was well known in the Praetorian Guard. Oh, yeah. Who was that? So the Praetorian Guard was more significant than we think. That was actually the inner elite guard in who guarded Caesar. And you remember the movie, uh, in parts of the scenes, Gladiator, we were talking about like manliness and trying to show scenes of that. But anyway, they showed these members of the guard, you know, Roman guard, they're kind of around Caesar, but they made it look at that point, and maybe it is at times, where Caesar was totally in control of the Praetorian guards kind of in the background. We had different things, you had the Senate. And the Senate was really designed, you know, because if you don't have basic liberties and freedoms or the appearance of that, People rebel and butt because people want to be free. But what you really want is freedom to worship Christ and to live in Christ and to work. And as you're going to see today, um, the Go For Christ Ministries is going to be the perfect, the perfect entity that God gave to, to thrive, to produce, to live, to make, to everything God has planned and wants in us. Um, can come to fruition in the Go For Christ Ministries, living, producing for Him, excellence, giving it all to Him. It, and it's just going to work so perfectly. So people want that freedom, but unfortunately, what do you want? Sometimes you want freedom to sin, right? If you don't haven't given up your fleshy desires to worship in Christ, then you want the freedom to sin. But you want to be free of, you know, human, you know, tyranny and and. Um, you know, all these things about taxation and, and being forced to do this and that and just being driven in some by some human desire to do that, which is always seems to be the case for these demons in the world. It's just the way it always is in the worldly way. So the Praetorian Guard, there were it wasn't just Caesar and the Senate, like you always think about. Praetorian Guard was a huge, major political player. In fact, they assassinated several of the Caesars when they felt like they had too much power and did a turnover. And the one guy they rescued, um, I think it's, I believe it was Cassius, was, I, if we studied about him, was kind of like out and about. He was a non-threat. He, he was just not considered a huge threat. And they killed, assassinated the Caesar and ended up making him the Caesar because he felt like they could work with him, the Praetorian Guard felt like they could work with him, and the Senate unanimously um, approved him because they were scared of the Guard. So the Guard, Praetorian Guard, ended up being a huge political influence for 300 years in the Roman Empire. They were a huge, like, force politically, not just, you know, perfectly loyal, you know, obey orders Guard. So when he says that, the Praetorian Guard, I've got their attention permission. That was like as significant as whether Caesar approved it or the Senate approved it. When they approved it, that means the guard's like, he's good. So that's why the Lord used that reputation to allow him, remember in Romans, uh, um, the last chapter of Romans, you know, to have it, pay his own rent, have his own house. For two years he preached. They let him have visitors and guests, and he had one single guard. He earned their respect. Probably on the trip over there, the guards were like, "No, this this is this is unusually amazing." And he saved us, and he did this, and was this, and he's and so that reputation preceded him and allowed him the opportunity. So when he had that sort of reputation, that emboldened the other believers and allowed the other believers to share the gospel. And the gospel just in an impenetrable place under terrible conditions against Christianity, allow Christianity to just be preached in Rome under uh, under protection almost in the guard, but not really. He was in chains. I mean, he was still a prisoner, but the, God allowed that to for him to preach and the gospel just to spread. And, you know, he's writing 
and even ends um, Philippians with, in Caesar's household, greet you. We, we know he was in Rome. <laughs> So we know he was there. Like which prison? Did he write these? Caesar's household. Caesar's household. And the word literally means for household, I looked it up in Greek, literally means in the actual physical abode house of Caesar. So he was paying rent, but, you know, in that collection, but within that physical type household and holding audiences and preaching freely and receiving visitors. Not some dungeon. That's amazing. So that's the setting we're talking about. Hold for regard. Verse 13. Many trusted to live as Christ and to die as King. So, bottom line, Philippians 1, Christ is our model and Lord God. Philippians, that Christ is our model and Lord God, our citizenship is in heaven. All right, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity today to speak and preach and just worship God, just to worship and to elucidate the scriptures and just uh, all you're going to show us is just beyond comprehension. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome to our praise and worship, and let's open in prayer. Thank you, Father God. Just bless this time of worship and to bless this service, Lord, as we just worship you this first day of Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Second day. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, this is Go for Christ Hebrews 412 Ministries, where we take the living, breathing Word of God and Scripture, put it to unique music and worship. And this is here with Rachel Duncan, accompanied today by Angie Duncan. This is Psalm 141.
thank you, Lord. We just uh, open our minds and hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we go back to uh, Philippians chapter 1. We're talking about the failings, right? Of at least the one of uh, King Philip II of Macedon. 256 shoulders. It was called Habazat um, Toros which is basically the Greek word for foot companions. So he instituted that, or foot soldier, but foot companions. So literally, part of this, like fighting together, is you became a fighting unit, and these were your companions. So these 256, you bunked with them, you trained with them, you, they, were your, they were your cohorts, buddies, and developed a whole system where you would fight together, work together as a unit, think together, you know, so that was pretty neat, putting that together. So with Christ, taking the co same concept for Christ, I wrote this. The ultimate fellowship ring is the fellowship of the Messiah and its ring of disciples, sealed by the holy sword of the Spirit under God the Father and Christ and His Holy Spirit, who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So that's the ultimate fellowship. The sword of the Spirit, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And that spirit of fellowship, when you have that spirit of fellowship and that like-mindedness, you come together as a unit. You come together as a like-minded, unified. We've been everywhere, you know, from uh, India, Asia, uh, Africa, we've been throughout Latin America, Pacific Rim. Everywhere we go, the people are in the scripture and in the with the Spirit of God truly in them. It's unified. It's the same concepts. People are struggling from the same problems, the same sins. Everyone has all fall short, all sin and fall short of the glory of God, but can be saved by His grace. Romans 3 23 through 25 by the blood of Christ through his propitiation or payment. That everyone is struggling from the same sins and problems and the solution is Christ. And then when you have that, you have that unified spirit and you work together. And that's the Go For Christ Ministries model. So once you keep that in mind as we go through this, it's pretty incredible. So we lay down the groundwork, we talk about, and look at the attitude of gratitude Paul has when he's preaching. That attitude of gratitude as he's going through there, the whole spirit of unification, just how can you have that joy? How can you have deep joy? There's no other way to have joy, deep rooted joy, satisfaction other than in Christ. And he's sitting there going, I have joy in you. I love you. I have a deep rooted. How can he have love for an area in Macedonia? And he's Paul of Tarsus. Tarsus. The boy from Antioch, he's a, he's a, what kind of guy, what kind of Gentile? He's a Jew. He's a Jewish man. How can a Jewish man from Tarsus plug in almost a Pharisee in Jerusalem in his God and, the, and the, I mean, studying his credentials as a Pharisee in the study was beyond reproach in terms of zeal and legalism and study. And Unless you were that sect, they either try to convert you or didn't want anything to do with you because it was a very, the law it basically forbids you from even socializing um, with uncircumcised, you know, people to that degree. So for him to be in Macedonia, where in Greek city state, because by the time Paul came there, who was in charge? The Greeks had been defeated by the Romans. Yeah, so the Romans were in charge. And that plays along with Daniel's visions and everything else, or the visions he interpreted, rather. And so to have that love and joy for a group of people like that has to be supernatural. So this is what he's talking, the joy, the love I have for you. It's just amazing. In fact, let's stop now and let's go to Acts 16 and set the stage for Philippians.
Andrew, do you mind reading that? Yes, sir. Paul came also <clears throat> to Derby and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra. And he, sorry to interrupt, but he mentions Timothy in the book of the Philippians, and this is where he met him. How cool is that? That's awesome. At Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And they went on their way through the cities. They delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. So the churches who were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. Amen. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. So just as a reminder, that's kind of coming up here. This is Phrygia and Galatia. So they're kind of coming up here, not in Asia Minor. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Mysia here, Bithynia up there. To the on the Black Sea. So passing by Mysnia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Yes. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So what did Paul do? Immediately. immediately. Did what? <coughs> Went to Macedonia. Preached the gospel. <clears throat> obey. Immediately obey. He heard the Holy. He heard the Holy Spirit. Yes, all you said was absolutely true. Immediately he heard the Holy Spirit speaking, and he obeyed. He obeyed. He obeyed. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia in a Roman colony. So Philippi, we talk about the history of how Philippi became Philippi, and Alexander the Great kept its name, or name, or made sure it was called Philippi after his death. But it was actually a super important city in the Roman province. Like if you had uh, legal matters, or if you had a, a court, or um, a matter of things to do. So a lot of the Roman soldiers, um, after fighting and going into retirement, would say retired Philippi because it was Roman privileges were prevalent. It was it was patterned after Rome itself and kind of the customs and traditions. Uh, it was it felt like a Roman city and it had all the uh, legal and courts and provincial you know gathering uh, administrative rights and rule of a key pivotal Roman city. So Philippi was really a pivotal city in the Roman Empire as it had been before uh, for, the, for the Macedonian Greek Empire. So super, super important city, but very, very Greek, Roman and Greek. So what do you think, uh, how well is a Jew, Jewish person gonna do there, you know, or, or somebody coming in, an outsider? I mean, that was, it was, Super important. So I, it doesn't, I don't think, I'm, anyway, we'll keep going. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. So where did he usually go? To the synagogue. So I'm not sure um, whether there wasn't a synagogue even to be able to go worship in. Like, had that been eliminated as an official ability or um, did it just not mention it but anyway he went to where because you know you, there was why, why water yeah and the baptism cleaning rituals involved with the faith right whether Ju Judaism there's purification that has to happen so you need a place of water living water living water who is that's why it's so powerful. But their living water was 
water that was flowing in order to do purification rituals involved in basic worship and that that's complete baptism and purification in that so uh, that's interesting that he goes out and finds a, uh, a body of water and assumes that might be a place of worship because it was a source of living water pretty neat huh and also um the uh philippi used to be called um um quantities 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 meaning uh streams and bodies of water so that was the original name uh, of it before and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together one who heard us was a woman named lydia from the city of thyatira oh shoot trivia question i was gonna say who could have been arguably the first person in in Europe to receive Christ. Lydia? Yeah. <laughs> I meant to ask that before. A lady they mentioned. Hmm. A seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said to Paul. And after? Oh, and where was Lydia from? Philippi, right? Thyatira. Uh, which was? One of the seven. Yes. And famous for? Purple textiles, one of which was purple, purple cloth, and it actually developed another way to do it. Oh, the red, yeah, yeah the red, red and the blue coming together, which is pretty cool. So she brought her knowledge, industrial brain to Philippi. Pretty neat. Like a leading industrial city. She so had a city that made a lot of gold, a center of commerce, right on the pathway famous for producing gold, and now we know that we had a wealth of uh, textile and, and industry growing up, and one of the leading women who sold purple, which was super profitable, has become a believer. So we have a setup for what kind of ministry oh. from her? Oh. Like what are different ways you can serve the Lord? Oh, like a funding base? Resources. Mm -hmm. So we have a setup for a financial gifting and being a resource. Uh, and she'll, I mean, she's, obviously you can go and deploy with that skill, should go and deploy. Every disciple is called to go. But in the meantime, as you're preparing, you give, give, give. Um, like we did. We gave, remember we gave this, the 10% that we gave more. And then pretty soon we were giving impossible amounts, 20, 30%. And that's all you have to live on after your gross. You, 30% of your gross is about all you have to live on after bills and everything else. And we were given that somehow living, right? We never went hungry and we always paid our rent and had a roof. And then God called us to go give it all, to give it all and deploy. Yeah. So that's what's required. Yeah. And then you live and you have itself give all no. and after she was baptized and her household as well she urged us saying if you have judged me to be a, to be faithful to the Lord come to my house and stay and she prevailed upon us hospital gift of what whatever gift hospitality <clears throat> as we were going to the place of prayer we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling she followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to, to the Spirit, I command you, in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in on attacking them. And the so how would that work? So how would that play in a very Roman colony? Like, so they're saying... I mean, they're all about Roman customs and Roman this, and Roman that. So they use that politically to to stir up a riot, you know, against them. 
The crowd joined in in attacking them, and the magistrates tore their garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, having ordered the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So how disciplined was this guard if it was a very rigid Roman city? Like, he wanted to make sure. Yeah, his, his duties to the empire and his loyalty and, and gravity of how he took his job was about as serious as it could be at the top. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. So how do they use their time under duress? Singing hymns. <laughs> Testifying, singing hymns, witnessing, and the other prisoners sharing the gospel through the... <clears throat> and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. Oh, so it was probably like pitch black. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and his household, I mean uh, family. Then he brought them up to his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. So is he committed? To be, go ahead and be physically baptized in addition to receiving Christ. How awesome is that? Nice. But when it was day, the magistrate sent the police, saying, Let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have said to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And now do they... And do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them. And they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had, said, when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. So how uh, much gravity did that have after they were let go and then they found out they mistreated Roman citizens without proper procedure? Huge, right? And um, how incredible, how incredible was it that, uh, look, so did Paul come um, just with a bunch of words or did he come with, or what kind of, what kind of power and authority did Christ allow him to preach with? What are some examples of just the just stunning authority in which he shared the gospel in this chapter? Casting out a demon. In the name of Christ, demons cast out. And what happened on uh, the island um, before when other people tried to cast out demons? Or elsewhere. The guy. The, the demon was the like, dude. Jesus, I know. Paul, I recognize. But who are you? Somebody tried to bargain and pay for the power, you know, and somebody else uh, tried to cast out demons in another, you know, and the demon just pummeled them, pummeled them all. But, uh, but the Lord, with Christ working through Paul, allowed that to happen. That is the level of authority in which he preached. What else? What other example have? Um, oh yeah, his handkerchief. No, no yes, oh. yes, that's awesome. Ephesians, all of Asia heard the word. Oh, in this chapter, all the prisoners stayed in with him. Oh, what an earthquake! Yeah, earthquake and released them all. And all their bonds came out, and his charisma and power and authority was able to keep the prisoners together, so they didn't flood out in the streets and mayhem. 
that allowed the jailer the opportunity to come to Christ. But how powerful was that? Not only did he keep them there, but an earthquake released all their bonds and they survived and released everything. And what kind of power is that? So Paul came to Philippi and preached with authority. And he obeyed the Lord in doing so. And many came to Christ. And then he had a chance to go encourage them after all that, after they've been mistreated, after they've been, you know, they used their duress to praise God, after they had settled everything, he then got to go back and encourage the new believers and build the church that way with that level of authority. And what's the next place he went to, just looking briefly ahead? Thessalonica. Yeah. And so, did even Thessalonica, the, the Philippians, you know, I mean, they were, those people had resources and immediately just started putting their resources to work for the Lord. And he even received an offering in Thessalonica from the Philippians. In fact, of all the churches, very few of them actually unfortunately financially contributed but the Philippians did on multiple occasions so that's when you know that true living true faith and true joy God wants it all he wants it all all resources utilized for him and so when you're active and living your faith in Christ you give it all all your resources for the Lord We've talked about how to do that in the Go for Christ Ministries model. Other uh, places where uh, Philippi is mentioned, 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5. And then we'll follow that with Acts 26. Yes. 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Oh, so were they just a bunch of rich cats sitting around? No. But what happened? No, they actually, their abundance of joy and their extreme have overflowed in a wealth of generosity. Sacrificial giving. Give it all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like taking a piece of your flesh, right? Your money. But you, you want it all. And as you die to self and give it all to Christ, all resources, that's when he liberates you to have that, mm -hmm. that deep joy to see that Christ is for For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, so they gave even more than they could, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Just to be part so of they it. They were literally just like, begging just to, to be help. Part. Yeah, let's go, let's get the gospel. And this, not as we expect. Oh, sorry. And there were other people from Macedonia who we read about deploying and going. Everyone, every disciple called and answering the call as they go. Paphroditus for him. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord Amen. and then by the will of God to us. There you go. Yeah. Amen. Thanks, baby. Acts 26. Oh, Acts 26. Okay. We sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came then to Troas within five days. And there we stayed seven days. So coming back through Philippi on his way back to visit them. That's pretty cool. Okay. Or it mentions Philippi again there. Okay, so Philippians chapter 1. Starting in verse 21, where we left off. Philippians 121 is one to memorize. Yeah. That'd be a good song. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So remember, he's in prison. He doesn't know. He's joy. He's preaching. Yes, he's given everything. 
uh, he's sharing the gospel. Um, you might go into the last chapter in Romans and just read in that last part where he's he's in Rome. So he doesn't know whether he's going to live or die. He's waiting. He's appealed to Caesar. He's getting privileges. And he's preaching, but he doesn't know death or life. But either way, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. For if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. I do not know which to choose, but I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ. For that is very much better, far better. Yet to remain on the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in your proud confidence in me may abound Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. So he lays down accountability. You know, you live, max out for Christ like you're going to live the next day, the next day, the next day. If Christ takes you home, then you're with him. But meanwhile, you give everything you can, understanding the will of God and performing for the will of God in every way. Last chapter in Acts. Sorry. Uh, what did I say, Romans? Yes, sir. In Rome, in Acts. The Romans part of Acts. Uh-huh. When I'm mentally sending to you. Just that last paragraph. Okay. Or two paragraphs. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching them about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. With all boldness, without hindrance, preaching. And then we know from this, uh, when we get to the end of Philippians, we know he was right there in Caesar's household, which is amazing. And then we know from the beginning of Philippians, the whole Praetorian Guard had heard about him. So how incredible is that? So he's got the key, he's got the answer to life right here. Verse 26, so that you're proud, verse 27, only conduct yourselves, so this is the point, right? Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to you, see you, or remain absent, I will hear that you are standing firm in. In one spirit. So what is that, one spirit, is that what we're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Spirit of Christ. So you have to die to self and give up everything. All those uh, um, abominations of different denominations and different this and different sex and different this and that, all that goes away just as, as we talked about. Um, just one church under Christ, Scripture related. Um, the correct, just Scripture. Not man-made theology, just one scripture, one unity in mind and purpose. Just like it keeps talking about. And then not divisions based on, you know, your flesh or feeding your stomach or your own fleshly desires or your own man-made theology or aborting the scripture, but just one unified under the spirit. Living, if you go live for Christ, if you die to self and live fully dependent on Christ and his word, that winnowing, um, perseverance and persecution and endurance in Christ forces you to just clean and lean and just just listen, hear, and follow the scripture. And then that builds that unified spirit because it's just Christ. And Christ is just one Holy Spirit. A, the blast of wind, the pneuma from God's breath, it is God, it is Christ. And you're going to hear that a lot. The one Joy and the unified spirit. That's that's two big themes in this. That joyful thanksgiving and that unified spirit. With one mind, striving together for faith the gospel. And that's go for Christ Ministries, right? One mind, doing every business, everything you do, you make, you produce for the Lord, you're producing disciples, you're training disciples to deploy, 
with their business skill. It's one mind, all striving together, making things with excellence in Christ. The gospel capitalized. In no way alarmed by your opponents. So, should you be terrified about the world? I mean, it's, it's, it can be intimidating, but this says, do not be alarmed by your opponents because in your faith, Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. They kill you if they murder you unjustly, or it has to be unjustly. You get murdered, um, martyred, you go to heaven, you're with Christ. But if they don't, then you're living for Christ here, you max out for him. And you, you stand firm for him, for Christ. The only way they can get you is if they get you to compromise. You one foot in the world, one foot out. They compromise you for economics or compromise for some other um, worldly thing. If they get, that's the only way they can win, if they get you to compromise your faith. Remember he told Paul, I'll give you, I'll tell you what to say. And how many times have we been in a situation of impossible odds against mega, quote unquote, worldly opponents, impossible giants of the world, supposedly. And God's delivered us over and over and over again in an impossible way. Just by listening to Christ and being obedient. We've seen that for over a decade. We can testify that same Holy Spirit, and that same unified spirit is Paul, the Apostle Paul, which is a sign of destruction for them. So in no way be alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them. Because the Holy Spirit and God is in charge, they're gonna see that, right? And they're gonna know that. And they're gonna be, they're gonna know that that's an impossible thing for them to win. But salvation, but of salvation for you. So it's, it's a destruction for them, they're going to hell, but salvation for you because you persevered in the faith. And by the way, earlier I saw you taking some notes. There's a couple of key points, right? You, you have those marked? Those verses marked? Mm -hmm. Here, I'll go just because we're on that topic. So, verse 4, I saw you mark that, baby. Rachel. Verse 4. Oh, yeah. Don't we read it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Always in every prayer of mine, for you all are making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. From the first day until now. Oh, I did write that. So meaning? So like, I wrote, like, from, because of your partnership in the gospel, from the first day until now, first of all, they're persevering, and they have joy with everyone. And then verse 6. Verse 6. I saw you mark that. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to, the, to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So if you persevere, then you get to go to heaven. Exactly. It's a perseverance. How? What else is perfection? That means eternal life in Christ, getting, obtaining the goal. Mm -hmm. What does Paul say? He's obtained it, right? Mm -hmm. he says he hasn't obtained it yet. Mm -hmm. So that perseverance, he prays that that will become a perfect completion of that in Christ. Meaning, you persevere to the end. You die. Your flesh is in completely gone, and your spirit takes to heaven. He gives you new robes, right? You're in heaven with the new robes. Then you're perfected in Christ, meaning worthy of being in front of the Lord. But that persevering faith is what endures. So there's another perseverance verse, meaning you have to get after it. Persevere, get after it. <laughs> So that's all throughout the chapter two. Mm -hmm. So here it is, which is a sign of destruction for them, the salvation for you. And that too from God, right? Not from man, but from God. For to you has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also suffer for 
also suffer for his sake. Experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. All right, so chapter two. Therefore, if there be any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, any, there it is again, fellowship of the Spirit. So that's the ultimate fellowship we just read, right? So, the fellowship of the Messiah, the ultimate fellowship ring is the fellowship of the Messiah and its ring of disciples, sealed by the Holy Sword of the Spirit and Lord God, the Father, and Christ, and His Holy Spirit, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. So any fellowship of the Spirit, that's that unification of the Spirit. Any affection and compassion. Make, here it is again, joy. How do you get deep joy? Spirit. Clean conscious, pure joy. The God make, builds a joy in your heart that you can only get from Him. And when you disobey and sin, you end up empty. But if you sacrifice yourself and do it all for Christ, you get the deep joy because He made it that way because He's the Creator. Make my joy complete by being, again, of the same, same, mind. same mind. So that's that same unified spirit. This is Go for Christ Ministries, right? Go for Christ Ministries. Everyone's making, doing stuff. So. The same mind, maintaining the same love. How else could you have love except yeah, in Christ? Love. Yeah. United, here it is again, united in one spirit. In spirit. Intent on one purpose. Good. Do nothing and how so how do you get that? Do nothing from selfish ambition. Selfish ambition or empty conceit. But with humility. humility of mind, regard others, others. Is better than yourselves. Do not merely look out all for interest. your own interests. Your own personal interests. But for the interests interest of, of others. others. So let's go for Christ Ministries. Everyone is sacrificing their own personal interest. Your fleshly interest. Your real best personal interest would be to completely fill with Christ and have that deep joy. He's got the best plan for you. He's hungry to make you that awesome, perfect vessel. He takes that chunky, you just have that chunky, dirty piece of clay that's chipped and broken that can still hold a little bit of water but is contaminated. So you have to decide if you're going to hold on and be that chipped piece of pottery to go use on a some other thing out in the wilderness or break on the rock, which is Christ. Let him take that, take you and remold you into a beautiful creation, bring you into the wedding banquet, into the fold with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, be utilized in his holy banquet and be this beautiful thing, instrument in his hand, pouring pure living water that's going to nourish the soul's and, and be part of his kingdom plan. And it's the most ultimate thing ever. So you had to give up your own grip with a little finger, the little finger stuck in that. You know, you had to give that up and be utilized for Christ as the ultimate vessel in him. Now here's verse six. And verse six completely... Um, essentially misinterpreted in all the interpretations. So we're going to go back to Strong's and I'm going to show you what this, this has always been, you know how you have a spiritual, Holy Spirit, a barometer when you're really, and everything in the Bible connects and fits and works. Verse six, um, never worked for me. In the spirit. So let's look at Strong's in verse 6. This is a priceless mystery that the Lord showed me this morning. You know how we have those? So this is it. So open up your Strong's. Go to chapter 2. Mm -hmm. 
So if you look at Strong's Philippians 2, first word, host hey ho. So primary word meaning who, who or which. Second word, huparko. Huparko means one who is humbly or quietly come into existence. So putting those together, it's one who has humbly or quietly came into existence. So how did Christ come? Humble. He humbly, he humbly and quietly came into existence on the earth. Right? He was a, I mean, right? He was born in a, what, mansion? Barn, a stable, right? And then was the son of a king? Carpenter, he is son of the king of kings, yes, the Lord. But the, his earthly father was a carpenter. And he was from the capital city? No, he's from, where is he from? Galilee, Nazareth. Galilee. Good. Yeah. Perfect. So who humbly came into the humbly came into being? Look at the next word. In humbly came into being among in. Next word is morphe. So morphe is in the form, in the shape, or the form of literally means the form of. So humbly came into being, but in the actual form, you know, morph, the actual, the actual form of theos, God, deity, divinity. So if you look at, put those together so far, those words together, who humbly came into being in the actual morph form of God. So he humbly came into being, but in the actual form of God. So he humbly came into existence, but he was, he was in the form of God. You see? He humbly came into existence, but he was in the form of God. So humbly came into existence. Who? Humbly came into existence, but in the form of God. You understand? Jesus who humbly, humbly came into existence, but in the form of God. All right, what's the next? Theos. Hegiomai. Oh, so Hegiomai is with official authority, authoritative ruler judge. So now we have Jesus who humbly came into existence, but in the form of the authoritative judge God, in the form of the authoritative God. That's what the first part of the verse says. Jesus who humbly came into existence in the authoritative form of God, who was God, the authoritative, who was in, he was the authoritative form of God. Jesus humbly came into existence the, in the authoritative form of God. Humbly came into existence, but in the form of the authoritative God. You guys see that? Next word. Not. Like negative. Not harpegmos. Plundering. So put that together. Not plundering. Next word. Let's put the plundering. So Jesus, who humbly came into 
existence in the form of the absolute authoritative judge of God not plundering or robbing not plundering or robbing next word inehi lusting so not plundering or robbing in a lustful manner Jesus who humbly came into the world as the authoritative judge in the form of the authoritative God but not plundering, robbing, lusting in a plundering, lusting way Esau being similar or like a God Theos. So Jesus, who humbly came into existence, did he humbly come into existence? Jesus, who humbly came into existence in the absolute authoritative form of God, but not like a man trying to plunder or steal. like a God. So most men try to be God-like and plunder or try to take and seize God-like power. So most men come in and try to seize or take God-like power. Like stealing power and trying to be like a what? Yeah, trying to be like a demigod. So most men try to seize and plunder power like a demigod and become what was Satan tempted Jesus to do. Seize it man-made, in a man-made way to seize power. Did Christ come like that? Absolutely not. So we absolutely in no way, what happened when the disciples said, hey, we'll sit at your right, I'll sit at your left. Mom, can you go, you know, sons of thunder, we, you know, just kind of make some promises and deals here? Because they wanted that earthly king to come and what? Seize power. Did he do that? Did he show any desire to come physically as a man seize a crown like a man would do? Seize power? Like, what do we talk about here? This whole history, right, has been about this man seizing power, that man seizing power, this man, and he's in Philippi. He's right with the Philippians. Well, what happened to the Philippians? King Philip himself seized power, plundered and took the power. Maybe it was, you know, maybe there was a genetic line, but at the end of the day, any man in power, what? It's not going to the Lord and praying and God's putting him there is seizing power, right? And taking that power. And then this kingdom wanted to take power from that kingdom. And then this man wanted to seize power from that man. And this city-state wanted to seize power from that city-state. These people, and what are they doing war? There's plunder and pillaging, right? So he said, absolutely the negative, not coming in and seizing power like a man. But instead he came into existence as a humble Humbly came into existence. Humbly came into existence in the absolute authoritative judge form of God. That's what that verse is saying. Well, it's nowhere near what your scripture reads. In fact, it's, it, it's really um, quite the opposite almost. So your, the, the interpretations of this verse is, is completely out of place here. And let's read on. It's going to totally make sense to you. So what, what, is that not what Paul's been saying? Like-minded, yield yourself, give up yourself, be in Christ, be Christ-like, use Christ as the model, like Christ did. What did he do? He humbly came in in the absolute form of God with the authoritative judging form of God, not in the man-made seizing way, to plunder power. That's what that's what it says. That's literally what the scripture says. Look at verse 7. But Allah, like contrary, 
Kinu abased, emptied himself, voluntarily emptied himself. Hutu, pronoun himself, reflexive. No reputation, empty again. Took Lambano took upon himself. Accepted, like accepted upon, like see, like a accepted in a in a very like seizing way. Accepted, like it was thrust upon him, and he accepted it, not in a good way. Morph, he, but instead he took the morph. We just look at that word, right? The morph is the what? Form. Form shape. Good. Form shape of a. Doulas. You guys know that word, doulas. Oh, yeah. Instead, he voluntarily accepted what was thrown on him, the form of a servant. Genome. To pass. In. Resemblance. Homono. Hom homonoma is uh, the shape or resemblance of a, you know this word, anthropos. Anthropos, anthropology? Anthropology is the study of the, of man. So the shape or form of man. So he, so the whole scripture now comes alive. Christ who humbly, it came into, humbly came into existence and the absolute authoritative form of God not to plunder and seize power in a lustful way, not in a lustful way, seizing way, but humbled himself and took on the form of a man. Now that makes sense. That's everything scripture is saying before and after and now. That's like the entire scripture all coming together. And it goes on to make sense too. And Kai, Kai is a conjunction, attaching word. Next word, Herusku. Perceive, see. And seeing, schema, schema his, his condition, his actual condition. Pose a man, anthropos again, seeing his condition as a man, right? Anthropos. Tapino, literally depressed, humiliated, humble, literally abased or humbled himself. Humbled. Hutu himself, reflexive. Genoma, again, brought into being, brought to pass. Brought to pass. Hippukus in obedience or submission. Space and time. To Thanatos. Submitted himself to Thanatos. Death. Even, or sorry, death meaning and Thanatos Staros pole or cross of capital punishment. So now that works. Now that scripture works and makes sense in the way it was intended. His entire thing is like-minded, joy, humility of self, to live as Christ, to die as gain, give, be like-minded. And this is saying, written, read properly in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. Christ, who humbly came, 
in the absolute form of a just judge ruler of God, not absolutely not in a lustful criminal punishing way, uh, criminal way, lustful way of wanting to steal or seize power as a, as a, as a king or God. Oh, to seize power as a God, not to seize power as a God, but humbled himself in the form of a man as a doulos, as a servant, and even humbled himself to death on a cross. See, that maintains the deity of Christ, the way he came into the world, the absolute control deity of Christ, and his absolute humbling example to us. Completely opposite of the way it's written in modern day translations. He came as God, all authority, but not as one trying to seize or lust after or steal power as a God. Well, that just makes sense with all the gospel, with everything he's saying to the disciples, with everything he taught the disciples of the Holy Spirit from the beginning to the end. That just, that makes sense with the entire scripture and what he's teaching and what he's teaching throughout the chapter. And that's what's written. It is written. It is so. It is written, it is so. And it makes sense with the rest of it. Empty themselves, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God did what? Highly, amen. Sorry. Go ahead. Highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name, capital T, capital N, the name, which is above all, above all names. So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And let's just bow. Okay. Every knee will bow. In heaven, and on earth and all the abyss under the earth every knee will bow at the name of Jesus thank you Father God we bow we humble ourselves before you and every knee will bow before you and every knee everyone your name is esteemed and placed above every other name and all powerful you're, you, you're the king of kings and lord of lords we, we, we praise you God with all our heart every knee will bow before you in heaven and on earth and all the abyss below. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Well, back and finishing up on verse 10 and 11 again, chapter 2. So at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every, and we bow, and we did bow. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. So look at uh, your Strong's at verse 10. So it says, you know, on heaven, where, where's that? In heaven, right? Pointing up, she's pointing up. And on earth, which is, yeah, earth. And then it says, and under the earth. But look at the, look at the word, under the earth is, Catechthonios, and it's subterranean, infernal, belonging to the world of departed spirit. So it has a deeper connotation. So the departed world, subterranean, departed spirit, I mean that, they, everyone will bow. So that has a little more deeper meaning when you look at it that way. Verse 12, so then my beloved, or Andrew, you want to read starting on verse 12 to the end of the chapter? Yes, sir. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So I looked at the Greek on that. That's one of those key verses, perseverance verse. Oh, sorry, so talk to me about, it's literally what it says. Work out fear, work out your salvation. Here is powerful. So verse 12, 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, verse 12. So, Pater Gazomai, literally perform, work out, work a fully accomplished fashion. Like, you know, fashioning is like forging, right? I mean, literally, literally work to accomplish fashion, work it out. And then, literally fear and literally trembling. So, what is that? Putting that together. What does that mean? Work out your salvation with fear. Oh, and the word for salvation, rescue. Like, keep getting after it because you, you. I can't quite figure out how to verbalize it. No, you said it. Keep getting after it, too. To the end. To gain eternal life. Yeah. Keep getting after it. Complete it to the end for eternal life. Just like he said. It's just like keep work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So salvation, so it's a Where I was talking about that? To rescue, physically, morally, spiritually rescue. Health, salvation, save. You commented on that before, which. So, what is that? What is that? Or read that verse again and tell me what you think. So, read the verse again. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So, literally, like, work and strive to complete your salvation. So, you have to personally work and your own free will and choice to complete your salvation, meaning you have to get to the end with fear and trembling. So like Christ is someone to be feared and you don't want to go to hell. So just like work out your salvation, complete, reach the end, the goal. Just like it says. So that's, a, that's another what type of verse? Perseverance. perseverance. Good, another perseverance verse. Okay, so pick up with uh, 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if, even if I am poured out as a drink offering. Upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. So I looked all that up in Strong's, and it literally does mean that. I literally poured myself out as a sacrificial drink offering, and literally do all things without grumbling and disputing. It's just straight up like, you know, Father in Christ, just the Lord telling me joy. Grumble disputing, work together, one spirit. I poured myself out as a drink offering for you. We get that from what we've done here. Okay. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. So what is what do the uh, most people act like? Selfish. Doing things for the self-interest, which would how would that look if you were a pastor or quote unquote pastor or minister? What would that look like? Self-interest. Like you're not really looking to the storehouses. Mm -hmm. You're just trying to fill your storehouse barn. You're just trying to fill your own barns financially. Well, your real goal should be to empty the barns. And not be building barns, but to work or whatever the Lord's will to, or not whatever the Lord, Lord's will is to sell all and utilize all in the gospel, like the Go for Christ Ministries, your business, your day job, your everything, training disciples and sending disciples and sharing the gospel, not for self-interest, but literally just for Christ. 
all of them. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. How special was his relationship? Yeah. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all, and it has been dis and he has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am more eager to send him to you, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. So I looked up that word for foot soldier, and it literally is like a foot soldier. So how appropriate when we talk about the phalanx and those foot soldiers and foot companions working together, living together, learn how to work together, operate as a unit. How else can you function, 256 men function as a fighting unit and, and complete their task and mission. They're living together, they're eating together, they're learning each other's, you know, this and that, looking out for their self-interest working together to gain food or shelter, organized to, to win the fight. So here's, here's somebody who's working like a foot soldier with Paul, alongside Paul and Timothy, foot soldiers in Christ and the Lord. Now that is what, what he's looking for. And that's the Go For Christ Ministries, everyone working like a foot soldier, working together to produce and make stuff and different businesses and everything else. Do you mind reading to chapter three then? Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. What's he saying there? So, like, literally, he's just <laughs> repeating himself. And he's like, hey, writing the same things and repeating all this. It's a very hey, polite it's, way to say. It's safe. Listen up. <laughs> look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have no reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever I, whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, and righteousness from God depends on faith. So that what did you do when you got called to the mission field? What did you have to do? So we had to give up everything. You literally went out on that garage sale outside our house, took your prized possessions, your prized pets, your prized everything, your family that was friends, and you had to leave those behind in obedience to the Lord. And all that life had to offer you, rubbish compared to what Christ. But then we got so much more. But then what did you see? The scripture, now this scripture, because of that, is what? Living. Coming off the page and living. Yeah. The birds living, you hear that? Uh -huh. Man, what a beautiful sound. You can hear that and hear the gospel, and it's just such sweet music. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. 
Now that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join me in imitating... Well, so talk to me about that verse. So, he... Let us hold true to what we have attained. Talk to me about that. So, oh, let us hold true to what we have attained. So, we literally have attained it, meaning we've got it, meaning we've accepted Christ. But, so that literally says, okay, attained, accepted Christ. So, hold true. It wouldn't say hold true if you could just attain it and then be done with it. Yeah. So you got to hold true and persevere, and that also means you can fall away and lose your salvation. Yeah. That's true. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. That's what it continues to say throughout uh -huh. Scripture. <laughs> to write the same thing to you. It. It's no trouble for me and safe for you. <laughs> <laughs> Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have also for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their There's belly, yeah. and their glory and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body and by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. It's just saying exactly the same thing in the spirit. So there's another reason for suffering. And you could summarize it, suffering smelting for purification, along with Job 37, 13. But, so here's another, if anybody does a lesson or people have a question on why suffer for purification so that we may see and understand and obtain the resurrection from the dead and see the, the glorious things God has done. So there's a reason for suffering, smelting, purification, insight, depth. The cleaner you get, the leaner you get, the more Christ-like you get, suffering produces that. Getting the dross out and then you can really see, getting the scales, you know, the junk out. Going back to verse Philippians 3 8, can you reread that? Yes. And tell me about that. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. So, all the things he had before, like after he like realized Christ and found all the surpassing worth of like knowing Christ and all that he has to offer, everything else is just rubbish because of how great Christ is. Christ is the first stroke. Mm -hmm. That's what I wrote, two words, which you said was accurate. But I was, uh, my next hint was gonna be, do you know a parable in the Bible uh -huh. or a chapter? Uh, Matthew 13, 44 through 46. Priceless pearl. Good job, guys. I just wrote two words. Priceless pearl. <laughs> so there it is again. So all that suffering and everything you gave up and everything that you went and maxed out in the spirit is all. All the old stuff ended up being rubbish and you found life in Christ and now it's coming off the page. And you discover that because you did that. And now you can see the priceless pearl just as it was written here. Like she said, rubbish, and now you have know, life. Like the mirror of purification, and then you can see it. And then you're not even you, you're just reflecting Christ. The light, you're no longer. Now the silver is purified and able to reflect. Now the mirror becomes purposeful, and it's on the purposes. Reflect Christ. 
That's the price is real. And then you have Julia doing it. Just like this. I read chapter four. Sure. I can do it if you. Oh. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge. Oh, sorry. Joy and crown, once again, a reference to um, kings and power, and it all just fits. Oh. He wore this kind of. Uh, King Philip the second of Macedon looked kind of like. At least the one they have in this in the museum looks kind of like a laurel reef woven in a crown in a gold, you know. It kind of fit more like a band than it was like a yeah. You picture it. I urge Eodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. <laughs> These are two Christian women. What's he saying? <laughs> They're fighting. <laughs> He's telling oh, you two Christian ladies, uh, <laughs> get along. Yeah, get along. <laughs> Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement and also the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Psalm 37, 4, who has that one? I do. Oh. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So how does that fit with that verse? Yeah. Um, I mean, just, you know, just your prayers and your supplications, you know, offering your prayers to him and following him, they become one and the same. Because they're his. You pray for what he wants, and what he wants, you want, and these desires become the same. With that heart and attitude and joy. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, so it's like everything you wanted, but like. So, what do people get? Um, at first, when they sin and go astray and start doing wickedness, what what do you feel at first? Adrenaline. But what, yeah, and what is pricked? Your conscience. So your conscience is pricked. So how well do you sleep? How do you feel? How does your spirit feel? Unrestful? So you guys probably haven't been often in that situation, but you have friends in life as you go along or as you see people or you see things or something not, doesn't quite sit well in your, or maybe you've done something in treatment or something that you didn't quite feel restful and you have to come clean before the Lord and get your conscience clean in order to be able to have a, but then that peace guards your, because what happens, you have heartache, your mind, stress, everything aches and hurts, but the peace of Christ gives you that peace of conscience and that peace of the heart, guards your heart. I love it. Guard your mind, guard your heart, guard your spirit. Just like the helmet, salvation, guard your mind. Exactly. Peace of Christ. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, <clears throat> Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. So what should we focus on? Just the good and the lovely that the Lord Queen has functions. made and given. Mm -hmm. yep. So people know that what is good and what is bad, at least before your conscience gets seared, God's planted that in your mind. You know, name some things that you just know are bad, like uh, stealing, lying. What's something everyone kind of knows is wrong? Uh, those are correct. Other things. How about being faithful versus not oh, faithful? Yeah. Adultery. How about uh, obesity? That's you just d destroy your uh, temple. Um, it's, and God made things lovely, right? So what happens when you have a fit person, you know? 
they look as God intended, right? Or if you don't take care of that, um, other things that are other sins. Coveting something. Yeah, I really want something badly, and then mm -hmm. evil starts to creep in your mind. Like, look at inappropriate things or something. Like, that's polluting your mind. Yeah. Yeah. These are just things we know are wrong. So if, what's lovely? What are the opposite? What's what's good and pure and lovely? And, the Bible. And yeah. Bible. Birds. You know, beautiful Following flowers. God's rules. What? Following God's rules. Yeah, God's rules. Feels good. It's lovely. It's beautiful. It's just right. It, it creates a nice family, cohesive family. You work together, which is nice. And um, you're on the side of right. Who? Everyone in their right mind wants to be on the side of the right. You want to be on the righteous side. You want to be on the side of good. Good versus evil. You want. You want. If anybody in their right mind, you want good to win, and you want evil to be. You want grace, but you also want justice. You know, those are good, you know. Everything God talks about is good and lovely and pure. You just, you just know if you are if you have the right mind, if you're in your right mind. And you have to have, a, and the Holy Spirit cleans that for you. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, now that at last you have revived, uh, revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the manner of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Now that I seek the gift, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the profit which increases to your account. I have received everything in full and I have an abundance. I am, ampli I am amply supplied. I have received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever, amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are also with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. So there it is, especially those of Caesar's household. Pretty amazing. And then he says, um, I wanted you to give, not for my blessing, but for yours. What does that mean? Like what, how God will reward them for contributing. In the priceless pearl manner. Mm -hmm. In the Psalm 37. Oh. Another priceless pearl verse. Uh -huh. Like as they give, the more you give, the more he opens up your eyes. The more you sacrifice, the more you do, the more you're able to see the garden of God, the mustard tree in the center of the priceless pearl and treasure. So there's another verse. So Philippians 4.13, if you really look at that, if you break it, break down, go ahead and look at the Greek. It's chuo, avail, prevail, strength, pass all. Like conquer. 
they conquer. All, and then in, instrumentally, Christos. Hoitu, which Idunavo enables or strengthens, reflects of me. So what he's saying is all things, like Psalm 37, 4, all things that are in Christ's will, that Christ desires, all things that Christ wishes me to do, he enables me to do. Oh. That's what he's saying. All the things which glorify God and abundantly in God's plan that God desires for me to do in his plan that he so desires me to do for him, he then enables me and gives me the ability, strength, and power to do that for him, in him, and in Christ alone for his glory. That's what he's saying. And it's literally right after that. He says, and have you guys ex experienced those challenges, right? Where we don't have a bonded, right? We don't, and we've been in all situations and in whatever situation that is, if we're doing it for God's glory and power and in him, he literally gives us the strength to walk through that moment at that time for him, empowering us to serve him for him. That's what it's saying. So Thessalonica, so look at this. So we go from Philippi over to Thessalonica, and he's literally Berea Thessalonica right after that, right after he leaves Philippi and Thessalonica, they're already sending a gift. And he's receiving this gift with their correct attitude and heart, growing in Christ as a what? Fragrant offering. Sweet aroma, fragrant offering, sweet aroma, fragrant offering for the Lord because it's holy and acceptable. And he loves the fact that they're doing that. Yes, it sustains him, but they're also, they're in the game, they're sharing. And we saw this over and over. The more people give ourselves, the more you give, the more you, when you finally give it all to Christ, the more you change your heart. And you're giving your heart because your heart and treasure go together, scripture says. Yeah, and then we found that to be true. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And as you give, everything you then see and grow and, and serve and then the Lord has an infinitely better plan and that beautiful vessel in the wedding banquet using for the king of being the one words than you ever could have dreamed of with that shoddy piece of clay and if it sits there the rock's going to crush it but if you break on the rock he can then take it he'll kind of form it into something beautiful to use for him All right, let's pray. Andrew, you want to close? Yes, sir. Lord, thank you so much for sending your son to us. Lord, he humbled himself, Lord, even unto death on a cross, Lord, just to give us that ultimate opportunity to be able to see Christ, see that Christ is the Lord, confess our sins and serve you, Lord. Please just continue to guide us and help us, Lord. Thank you so much for just empowering us in your will, Lord. Thank you so much for making the ultimate system, Lord, where as we pursue you, Lord, you, our desires become your desires, Lord. It's just the ultimate, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord. We confess our sins, Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. You don't pray, thank you. Yeah, Lord, just thank you so much for all this wisdom, Lord, and understanding, and just as we give everything to you, you just give us just so much, Lord, it's just beyond comprehension, Lord, and just thank you so much for the joy you've given us and the purpose and just the fulfillment. Amen. Amen. Sarah. Well, Father God, just thank you so much for this message today and just opening our eyes to it, Lord, and just help us, um, just everything that you give for us to do, Lord, help us to do those things, and we know that in those things that you give us, Lord, you will give us the strength to do that and to walk through it and to... Um, just enable us to do your will, Father God. And we know that you're with us just every step of the way. And um, just let us remember that just this coming week and just and all the time to come, Lord, to, to
to focus on you and to focus on what you give us to do, Lord, just knowing that you will give us the strength to walk through that. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, welcome back. And this is uh, the first day, uh, first Sunday of the month. We celebrate the Lord's Passover. It's a holy, holy, holy ceremony. It's one of our sacred ceremonies that the Lord asks us to remember and to do in honor of him and in remembrance of his death and sacrifice we talked about. He humbled himself to death, even death on a cross, and was resurrected. Um, but as we take the, the bread and the fruit of the vine, which we use grape juice, as we break the bread, we remember Christ's body that he sacrificed, but also just like he sustained them with with manna in the desert, and um, also as they're celebrating literally the Passover meal. And the Passover meal uh, was when the angel of death came, the final plague in Egypt when they were slaves, and the ones who obey God and put the blood of the lamb over their door with the hyssop, they, the angel of death passed over and didn't take the firstborn son. And so Christ is coming now through the sheep gate. He's about to is the ultimate, is a perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And that blood of that lamb, and he comes back, we see him throughout the scripture as that from the beginning to the end. That perfect sacrifice, he came and died for our sins, and then we'll be raised again on the third day, resurrected. And it's been 40 days um, teaching the disciples, talk to them, and then resurrected in front of so many people rose, ascended to the right hand of God through the clouds and the angels even talking then. Um, talk about in Corinthians, your attitude for having this. If you don't have the right attitude, uh, there's penalties, sickness, and problems. So this is a very, very grave, very serious and holy thing. So you have to have a clean conscience and you must come with the right attitude before Christ. So if you want to take a minute now, just turn off the video, make sure you're clean before the Lord or don't participate at all if you feel like that's not the case. Because if you participate in this incorrectly, there's penalty, the Lord says, the Bible says, the Holy Word says. Um, if you're a baptized believer, if you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit, repented and received Christ, you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit that way, and can see Christ, and you're currently persevering in Christ. You went on to be um, in obedience to Christ. You, uh, one of the signs is you've had the desire to be physically baptized in Christ in obedience to the Lord because you want to be a committed disciple. That's one of the signs that you know in your heart you've you've chosen and to undergo that holy act of obedience. Um, if you're that believer persevering in Christ, uh, then uh, you're welcome, then you understand the significance of this. And you, you, Christ says to do this to his disciples. He commanded his disciples to do this in remembrance of me. So we're doing that this today. And I'll read out of Matthew 26. The one of the 12 named Judas Iscariot. So this is having the wrong attitude. Went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they weighed out 30 pieces of silver. 30 shekels of silver for him. From then on, they began looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, that's the Passover, the disciples, because they prepared the Passover feast and they had unleavened bread so they'd be ready to go because right after the um, firstborn, every family in Egypt died. Just as the Lord said would happen, they asked them to leave, they gave them money, they gave them supplies and they had to be ready to go so the unleavened bread they could take a lot of bread with them and also be ready to travel with that bread so that they could go in any part of the red sea that left egypt in a miraculous way and god said to keep this festival up until this time because this and this is the time christ came back during this time where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the passover and he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is near. I am to keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. 
The disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Now when evening came, Jesus was reclining, reclining at the table with his twelve disciples. Can you picture that? Jesus reclining with his disciples, knowing what was at hand. As they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved, that each one began to see, say to him, Surely not I, Lord. And he answered, He who dipped his hand with me in the bowl is the one who will betray me. The Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. And Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. So that's not the attitude. While they were eating, and think about what Jesus did and what he underwent for us. This is in remembrance of that. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. So the bread, as he said later and explained earlier, the bread is the bread of life. Just like the manna came down, his body is the bread of life, which is the word of God, which that is what sustains you and gives you eternal life. That's what he meant by this is the bread. Whoever eats it means consume the scripture, which is Christ, and Christ is the scripture, as John says in 1 John. So if you take in Christ and get rid of self, that's eternal life. This is my body. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. And so the, the, the vine, the grape, represents his blood poured out and forgiveness of our sins because by the blood of Christ, that's how we get, if we receive it, we get forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Meaning, he was about time to go. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So Jesus, after a blessing, and Lord, just bless this, bless this Passover, Lord, bless this, this holy sacrament that we offer for you in keeping the Passover, Lord. Jesus, let me pray. Amen. And the Lord's Supper. So after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. To take, eat, this is my body. And we took a moment before this, we all took a moment and prayed and made sure we were prepared mentally and spiritually for this, as you did by stopping video. When you take in the cup and give it thanks, thank you, Lord, for your provision, for your sacrifice, and for what you did, Lord. Thank you so much. Would you stand to pray? Mm -hmm. When you take in the cup and give it thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. said do this and remember us me. All right, thank you Father God and just uh, thank you for your sacrifice God and all that you went through for us and for giving us eternal life. Peace and pray.
Andrew, do you mind closing with Romans 12, 1 and 2? Yes, sir. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. Thank you.